What's up, folks? It's Coach Beard back with you. Uh, another episode here of Outside the Lab, our video podcast series on YouTube that is brought to you by the Performance Center and powered by Under Armour. Uh, very happy to introduce to you a good buddy of mine. Uh, we grew up together, known each other a long time, played together, uh, actually got our first coaching job together at the, uh, at the Legion, and he has now uh, worked his way up. He's an assistant coach at North Carolina A&T, um, having some success there. Uh, he and Coach Hall and those guys have really turned the program around, doing some great things. Uh, so happy to introduce Steph and Jordan. Steph, thanks for coming on with us, bud. Appreciate it, Cam. Uh, obviously, this is a this is a treat. I always try to get back and recruit as much as possible back home, uh, any chance that I can possibly get. So uh, I, I was thinking about it whenever you asked me to do this thing. How how funny <laughs> we we played together. <clears throat> I think when we were like 11 or 12 with the Catawba yeah. Valley storm and then a little bit farther ahead played for uh, coach Rembert uh, with the Legion team. And then first coaching job, man, that was, that was a fun summer. <laughs> it was a, it was a learning experience to say. No the doubt. Least. And we'll talk um, about that, but no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got, we, I mean, we both have some stories from that summer, but um, I mean, it is awesome to be on here uh, and I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Hey, speaking of uh, of Legion and, and four, I forgot to tell you before I clicked record, but four said make sure you mention your your favorite coach of all time as we as we go. Through. <laughs> hey, I'll be honest, man. It, uh, he's he's probably he's definitely my favorite coach of all time. I mean, you you played for him for three or four years. I don't. I mean, I I can't credit him enough. Um, he's one of the guys that I sort of try to model myself after in terms of a coaching sense. Uh, obviously, we've got slightly different personalities he's a he's a pretty <laughs> he's a little yeah. bit more fiery and he he said some things uh that just blew my mind at times but um whether they were true or made up i'm not sure to this <laughs> day but they they got us fired up so but we all believed him at the time that's 100 sure. <laughs> <100%. laughs> uh anyway we going for that for a while but anyway no, no. um hey and, and and speaking of being a local guy i forgot to mention stefan's from maiden uh graduated from maiden high school so hometown guy and uh next time you come home we got to get you by the facility man we're uh uh we're trying to get guys in there and uh would love to have you come by so uh steph go go into your background for us we mentioned a few things being from maiden and the legion but kind of take us through playing days uh coaching and, and all the way up to where you're at now yeah so graduated from maiden um ended up playing at north carolina a t as well um so that was a that was a fun fun experience um off the field, couldn't have asked for more. Uh, made some of my best friends of in my life in my four years at A&T. On the field, it was up and down, honestly. Um, the head coach that was there that recruited me there and coached me my freshman year resigned af after my freshman year. And and then there was a coaching change. And it was it was <laughs> a, a, a definitely a weird time for the program, um, unfortunately. But at the end of the day, had a great time, um, played a lot. I uh, got a good degree. Whenever I was done playing, I knew, I mean, you and I were in the same boat, sort of. We knew we wanted to coach it at some level as, whenever we were done playing. Um, got the opportunity to coach with you, uh, obviously, with the with Post 48. Um, the next summer, uh, I accepted my first college coaching job at Marietta College in Marietta, Ohio, uh, Division Three powerhouse. I never even heard of them, honestly. I just had one connection with them, and they needed a, a facilities guy slash assistant baseball coach. Um, so I applied, got the job, uh, ended up learning from a coach that won three national championships at the Division Three level uh, at a school that is like truly to the to the truest sense a baseball school. Uh, they've won six national championships. Uh, the the level of expectation is is very high. Um, no matter what level you play at, that that level of expectation is huge. Um, and that was my first real taste of of that kind of expectation um, and the amount of work that it takes to to meet that expectation. So that was an incredible experience. Um, but it was it was up in Ohio, cold. I was a facilities worker, so it wasn't <laughs> the most fun at times. Uh, so I had the opportunity to come back to A&T uh, as a volunteer assistant with uh, Coach Hall. And I didn't play for him, but I, I'd met him once or twice and talked to him, and I knew I wanted to work with him if I had the chance. Um, 
So the rest is history. I was the volunteer for a year. Uh, one of the other assistants left and I got to bump up into his spot. And then I think for the first two, two and a half years that I was a recruiting, I was the youngest uh, division one recruiting assistant coach <laughs> in the state. Yeah. Uh, so that was, that was sort of getting thrown into the fire, but I mean, there's no better way to learn um, than, than actually doing it. So it was a, it was a lot of fun and I'm still doing it now and who knows what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Folks, as you can tell, um, Steph's still young. Steph's not even 30 yet, but uh, <laughs> wide range of experiences um, and, and been around a lot of great people. And I, I hadn't planned on, on talking about this, but, you know, we've talked about uh, Coach Rembert. Uh, you've talked about the, the, the coach up in Ohio, uh, three-time national champion, Coach Hall. Uh, I've been lucky enough, uh, whether it was Coach Rembert, Coach Gant, uh, Coach Curtis here at the high school, to, to really have people – uh, who I look up to and kind of model, you know, what what I'm doing as a coach after. Uh, so kind of talk about, you know, if you will, for a second, the importance of having that that person or those people uh, who have been there, done that, who are, you know, 10, 20, some longer than that, years older than us, ton of experience kind of lean on it and help guide us through this thing. Yeah, I mean, and the, the cool part about it is they're they're about as different as they come. I mean, yeah, Co Coach Hall is – I feel like I could have any type of conversation with him at any point. Um, there's more of a give and take. He's given me a ton of responsibility from the moment uh, that he hired me as the volunteer. Um, now the the coach with Marietta, I mean, there were times where I was afraid of him, honestly, because <laughs> I mean, he was, he was that kind of guy and it was very intense. Um, but at the end of the day, I never uh, questioned his motive. Uh, and I learned so much from him in one year. Um, and then obviously with Coach Rembert, I mean, there was a there was a ton that I learned from him. Um, his his passion is unmatched. Uh, like to this day, I don't know if, if there's a, a guy that's more passionate about baseball that I've met or or actually come into contact with. Um, but you can see it in their eyes. And I just think about uh, like looking and, and losing a tough game or or whatever the deal might be, or generally the, the the most important things that you find out about a person is is during adversity. Um, so during troubling times, during a losing streak, during a slump, whatever it might be, that's when your true colors start to show. Um, and there was never a time, uh, Coach Rembert, Coach Hall, Coach Brewer up at Ohio, uh, that's when they sort of shine the, the brightest, uh, leading you out of those situations. Uh, so that's that's what I took from them. different styles, 100 percent different styles. Uh, so you sort of take it uh, bits and pieces from each one and, and apply it to yourself. However, you can best um, apply it. Uh, and and that's what I've sort of done. I mean, like you said, I mean, we're the same age. We're we're young in this process, um, despite having a, a decent amount of experience uh, at this age. But I mean, I I watched your videos with with Coach Bignall, Coach Huff, and and uh, <laughs> with Coach Beck. I mean, I, I watch those guys on the road. I try to pick their brains anytime I get a chance to. Uh, so a little bit of that uh, goes into it goes a long way. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure you're the same way. But I can't tell you how many times I've I've been in those tough situations you're talking about, and, and thought to myself, what in the world would Coach Curtis do right here? Yeah. What would what would Ford do? What would he say to these guys? Um, so it's, it's it's great to have those people who are, you know, kind of helping us along. And uh, we're, I, I guess, six years into this now. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think back often on those, you know, first first games in, in 2014 <laughs> where we're out there and there's, there's 10, 11 players. You know, we're we're coaching the heck out of them, doing the best we can. But I, I look back and I think, man, I'd like to go back and slap that dude. <laughs> he didn't have a clue what was going on. No. Uh, so, you know, and, 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 and I feel like whether it's, whether it's experience, whether it's, you know, some age or, or these mentors, I feel like personally I've, I've grown a lot. I got a long way to go, trust me, but I've, I've grown a lot in six years, um, kind of figured some things out, uh, matured a, a, as a coach. Um, so talk about how you, you've kind of grown into, uh, you know, the, the coach you are today. Yeah. I mean, the, I, I guess it's trial and error. I mean, like what you were saying, I mean, looking back, I mean, the first, some of the decisions that I've made along the way, I mean, uh, 
I look back and say, like, "Why on earth did I say that? That was that, that was like the exact opposite thing that I needed to say." Uh, but if you never look back and and have those those discussions with yourself and and have people like we've already talked about that are actually going to be honest with you um, and say, "Hey, you probably shouldn't have done that." Hey, moving forward, we need to do this, whatever it might be. Um, but I mean, there there's only one way to to learn, I think, and and that's by actually doing it. Um, you can't just whatever it might be. I know social media is huge now, but uh, it, you can't just sit behind a keyboard and coach. You, you got to actually get your hands dirty. And and uh, that's one thing that our, our coaching staff has done a, a lot of. I mean, we're not afraid to fail. Uh, we're, we get out there and and uh, actually do it. Anytime that I'm working with catchers or hitters uh, and I want them to do something weird or do something different, I'm, I'm going to do it myself and just see what it's like. Uh, I'm not going to tell them to do anything that I've never done personally myself, especially being young and able uh, right now. So uh, I think openness to new things, but uh, but a healthy amount of skepticism would would help would would define my my mindset in terms of new coaching strategies and and stuff like that. Uh, I, I'm I try to keep it as much of a mixture of new school and old school as possible. Um, especially on the hitting side, because I feel like that's the the most controversial right now. I mean, no catching catching is easy. I feel like compared to hitting, <laughs> so, uh, you don't have anybody breathing down your neck on on Twitter w- about the stuff that you teach with uh, catching. Uh, so uh, there's a there's a lot that goes into it, obviously, but that's that's the gist of it. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome stuff and, and a ton of good things there. Um, so let's let, let's let's go specifically to A and T now, and and I want to start back when when you got there, and uh, I guess the fall of 2010, and uh, as a freshman, one thing that that we're really trying to to talk about and instill with our players is is one of our top goals, no doubt, is to help guys have opportunities at the next level, uh, if you know if if they're fortunate enough. But we don't just want you to to go to college and have a chance to play. We want you to step foot on campus day one that August, knowing exactly what to expect, knowing how to compete, uh, knowing how to, to fit right in uh, and have a chance at, at playing and contributing from day one and not taking two years to get your feet wet. And, and you did that. I mean, you were a four year starter behind the dish at A&T. So talk to our guys about you know, how, how do you prepare? How do you make sure you're ready day one when you get there? I um, mean, that's, that's a big thing that we've been talking about just recently in terms of our, our own coaching staff. I mean, me, me and Coach Hall talked about it uh, last night, actually, with, with some of our guys. Um, we, you, I think the biggest thing for me whenever I came in that I, was, that I was lacking was just a physical readiness in terms of strength. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, yeah. I'm, still, I'm still skin and bones, sort of. Uh, but whenever I, was, I graduated high school, I mean, I was six foot one, 160 pounds as a catcher. That's not, <laughs> that's not great. Uh, and so I had, had to work my tail off to, to just to get to like 185. Um, and that is probably the biggest thing that I've noticed in terms of a physical sense um, of, of high school seniors into college freshmen. Uh, the physical difference between a high school senior and a college senior is, is really, really different. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a, yeah, it's a grown man versus a, a young, you know, like a, a boy pretty much. Um, so the physical side is, is huge. Do as much strength and conditioning as you possibly can. Um, we've got time to work on the swing. We've got time to work on little techniques and stuff uh, in the fall, in the fall practice season. Um, as long as it's not a glaring thing, but uh, physical conditioning is, is huge whenever you're getting there. Uh, but the, I think, What's probably even bigger than that is the mental side of it. And uh, I know, I mean, you were one of my favorite teammates to play with because after after a game or after a loss, you could see it in people's eyes who took it as seriously as you did. And and uh, there were a bunch of guys that we played with that had that mindset. And I think you and I both took it to college, uh, that mindset that we weren't going to back down from anything. I was I was there to make friends for sure. I mean, it was they were my teammates and – uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, I wanted to play. Uh, I wanted to contribute from day one. Um, I, I wanted to win the job. Uh, that mindset that just consumed everything that we did. Um, we've we've had guys that sort of get in there, and there might be a, a junior or a senior that played last year um, ahead of them, 
and they sort of just see the writing on the wall and, and don't do everything they can. And I was like, and I tried to talk them out of it. I was like, no, man, like the best guy's going to play. No, oh, that's, that's the it. The best guy's going to play. We have to win uh, to keep our jobs. Uh, so the best guy's going to play 100% of the time, um, no matter what year it is. So that, that mindset going in needs to be, I'm going to do whatever I can possibly do to win the job. Um, no setback, whatever, uh, whatever might happen. They just have to go in there with that mindset. Uh, and that would just obviously make the physical side a little bit better because you're doing everything that you possibly can do. Uh, but then you're not afraid of any situation that might arise, especially without any experience. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's that's so true, man, that that competitive edge, um, you know, whether it's a guy who's a couple years older than you uh, or even I mean, we, we both experience this. I mean, once you get there, th there's another yeah. class coming in behind <laughs> you. You know, coaches recruiting the the next guys. There's there, there's constant competition to figure out who the best nine are and who can go contribute. So that that mindset is huge. And that's that's so true. I, I hope our folks are. Uh, really go back and listen to that. Uh, there's several good things in there. Let, let's talk about A and T and kind of where it's at now. I mean, campus is is growing. Uh, you know, in Greensboro, beautiful place, right in the middle of the uh, of the state. A uh, ton of good baseball in that area, uh, as we all know. Uh, you guys have, have got some updates as far as facilities with, with a with a new indoor uh, or transitioning in a, an old building into an indoor facility for you guys. So, kind of showcase A and T for our folks who maybe not uh, they're not as familiar. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I say this all the time. It's a hidden gem uh, of a campus. I mean, yeah, I, I played I played here. Uh, I got recruited to, to come here. The first time I'd ever heard of A&T was uh, whenever I got my first recruiting call from Coach Love. Uh, so that, so that, and I only lived an hour and a half away and I've and I've recruited kids that live 30, 45 minutes away from Greensboro that have never heard of it or or have never stepped foot on campus for whatever reason. Um, but. I mean, it's a it's a great campus. I mean, it is it is phenomenal with the growth since even since I've graduated. Uh, so I graduated 2014 uh, from there. And, and since then, there's been five new buildings and there's more on the way. Uh, so it is a growing institution. Uh, we're about to reach 13000 students for the first time in school history. Um, so the, the dorms are about to be uh, getting built. There's a $90 million engineering building right on the corner of campus that's opening, I think, in January. Uh, we just opened a $90 million uh, student union building. So uh, the school is doing really well. And the, the good thing about it is they're reinvesting actually into the campus. It's not like we're just sitting on a bunch of funds from from uh, tuition and fees or anything. But it is a it is a lot. Uh, there's a lot going on with the school and the athletic department that we have to be excited about, um, not just the baseball program, because if it was just us, then some of this stuff wouldn't mean as much. Uh, but the school itself, I mean, enrollment is going up at the same time. The GPA and test scores of entering students are also rising. Uh, so we're getting more students at a better uh, at a better level of student. Um, the athletic department across the board is having success, and that starts with uh, our AD, Earl Hilden. I mean, he's a, a – and even above that, the chancellor, uh, Chancellor Martin of the school. I mean, they're athletics-focused uh, people, and they understand the, the benefits of having winning athletic department, uh, football, basketball, track and field, uh, baseball, volleyball, you name it. Uh, we're, we're winning conference championships, so – uh, the biggest thing that I try to get across to people is that we are growing at a, at a very uh, good rate in terms of success and size. Uh, and, and that's not stopping anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, we've got, we're transitioning over from uh, the MEAC to the Big South uh, after next year. That's going to be a big move for us, especially baseball. Um, I think it's the biggest jump in terms of conference RPI. Uh, in terms of sports is baseball compared to the other sports. So that'll be exciting, new challenge. And the recruiting side of that, I mean, it, we're, we're trying to bring in the best players that we possibly can. And we, we won the MEAC two years ago, the tournament. We've won the regular season the past two years. We were, uh, I feel like we were well on our, on our way to do it again this year. And we were trying to do it. Uh, uh, hopefully we can play next year. <laughs> Everything's up in the air. So, uh, Hopefully we get the chance to do it again next year for our last season in the MEAC and, and then go into the Big South and have an immediate impact in that conference. Uh, but, yeah, like you said, Greensboro, 
phenomenal city. Uh, I've, I've grown to love it. I've spent eight years of my life there now. A uh, little bit of everything in Greensboro is the third biggest city in the state behind Charlotte and Raleigh. Um, but on top of that, you're about 10 minute drive uh, from the middle of nowhere. So you got, got a little bit of both. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's fun. It's a fun thing to be a part of. Um, the atmosphere around the athletic department is, is a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the, the basics of it. Yeah, man, you, you hit on a ton and, and, you know, one of the big things is, is uh, that growth that you're talking about, whether it's, it's enrollment, whether it's new conferences, test scores, all that indicates that there's good things happening uh, on yeah. campus, which is awesome. It's a great place to go to. Uh, and I agree. I, I think it's a hidden gem. Uh, I mean, there's, there, there's so many uh, quality schools in our area. It's what we were talking about the other day is I think there's, there's like 18 Division One baseball programs in, in North Carolina. Uh, yeah, but it yeah, goes farther than that. I mean, the, 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 yeah. uh, just the fact that we have 18 Division One schools in North Carolina is, is astounding. I mean, there's more in North Carolina than there are in Florida. Yeah. Um, and then, but I mean, you've got really good Division Two program. I mean, you went yeah. to one, Catawba. I mean, they yeah. uh, y'all would have beat the breaks off of us if we played you guys in college. I mean, y'all were <laughs> y'all were loaded. Um, I mean, Mount Olive, Wingate, Belmont yeah. Abbott, but then you got. Uh, Division three and JUCO teams too. I mean, we we committed guys from JUCOs as well, in state and out of state. So I mean, it's the level of baseball and the amount of baseball in North Carolina is is insane. It is, it, and like you said, at at, at all levels, it it's uh, you know top to bottom, uh, certainly one of the best in the uh, in in the country. So uh, that's awesome stuff. And 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 you guys, uh, you were being pretty humble there. You guys have had some success recently. Uh, I mean, Thirty. <laughs> 30 win season, uh, you know, in 2018, you guys went to a regional down at Chapel Hill. You're talking about winning the conference. When you guys are doing some, some really, really good stuff there. So, uh, as is the whole athletic department. God, the, the yeah. football team's winning 12 and 13 games, and a uh, lot, lot of things uh, going good for you guys. And, and that, let's talk about the the conference change. That's that's huge. Uh, so, for folks who who don't know the the MEAC, um, I mean, that spans all the way down into Florida, right, with, with A&M? I mean, so the, the MEAC goes from Delaware all the way down to Florida. Holy cow. Uh, yeah, so Delaware State, I think, is the northernmost school. And then um, you've got Bethune-Cookman and Daytona Beach, and you've got Florida A&M, which is in Tallahassee. So um, it's, it's fun to go to those places, but, I mean, uh, we are not a huge budget institution, so we're not flying. Um, so those, those 13-hour bus rides to Tallahassee, uh, I'm not sad to see those go not at all. all. <laughs> how is how do you think recruiting for you guys is going to change? You, you go from recruiting again. I mean, you got Bethune. Those people are, are you're saying 13 hours away. Now, all of a sudden, it's it's High Point and it's Gardner Webb and it's, yeah. Ashford, you know, it's Radford. It's guys in the in the in the backyard. So what kind of change do you think that'll have? So I, honestly, we don't. The only in-conference team that we generally run into a recruiting battles is North Carolina Central. I mean, with us being a public school, um, tuition and fees for in-state is very low. Uh, so we generally stay – most of our roster is made up with in-state players. Um, so at, in a recruiting standpoint, the battles that we go into are not really going to change that much. Um, the Most of the guys that we uh, recruit – uh, they are they're getting recruited by High Point. Um, well, not so much High Point because they they've got <laughs> they've got their own thing. Yeah. Um, but UNC Greensboro, uh, Charlotte, Campbell. Um, so it's not going to change a ton in terms of that. What I think it'll change uh, is is really just like the student athlete experience while they're at A and T. Yeah. Um, Which so is you. It, it's the competition level as a whole will be a little bit better. Um, like I said, with the conference RPI going up, I think about 10 spots. Um, but then the travel is going to be significantly less. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to be right in the middle, I think, of the conference footprint. Uh, I think the farthest south we'll have to go is Charleston. Uh, the farthest north I think we'll have to go is, is Radford. Uh, so that's <laughs> a yeah. lot of in-state travel. Difference. Yeah, huge difference. I mean, right now we're going down to Florida A&M. Uh, playing Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Those guys, they miss class definitely on Thursday, uh, definitely on Friday. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, we we come back, and then it's uh, pretty much sleepwalk into class on Monday. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a huge benefit for the guys that are actually here on campus. Um, the competition level is big. I think it's going to spur uh, a lot of facilities upgrades as well. So that's exciting. Uh, we've, we've had a bunch of talks about facilities upgrades. So 
Um, that that's in the fu near future, uh, hopefully near rather than farther, but, um, we're, we're excited. Um, uh, hopefully we finish the MEAC out strong next year and, and go out on top and, and tip our caps and head to the big South with, with something to prove. There you go. Hey, let me, let me kind of tie some things together. So we're talking about the, the success you guys had. And then one thing you mentioned at the very beginning was, was the idea of, of expectation that you kind of learned and, and, and experienced up in Ohio. Um, so in 2018, you guys go to a regional for the first time in a decade. Yeah, since before. 2005. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, so more than that, and 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 didn't get you know the outcome you wanted in Chapel Hill, but but got that experience, played on the you know national spotlight, big time deal there. Now all of a sudden, next year uh, or last year, I guess it was, you, you you guys go down to Columbia, go to Founders Park, and shut out South Carolina two nothing in the midweek game. So talk about how you know you your guys. Uh, experienced some success. Now there's that expectation. Now all of a sudden we're, we're blanking a SEC school at their park. Kind of how all that, you know, uh, has happened. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the expectations at North Carolina A&T uh, have definitely been shifting. Um, there, There's no question about it. Uh, we used to uh, – that 2018 team was, it was fun. I mean, it was a blast. Uh, we were red hot, as hot as we can be going into the, the, the end of the season. Um, but – Still, to that point, we'd never accomplished anything or really accomplished the goals that we had set out. We'd never won the regular season, didn't win the conference tournament, like you said, uh, since two thousand or since we two thousand and five was the last time A&T had been to the to a regional. Um, so the expectation wasn't really it wasn't an expectation; it was a goal uh, to to win the conference tournament, and that's all we talked about. I mean, we wanted to win the conference tournament, wanted to win the conference tournament. And we didn't say – we didn't speak one word about what we were going to do after we won the conference tournament. Uh, so we, we did it, and we went to a regional, and we were like, well, now what? <laughs> so, so that part was was a huge learning experience. Um, we, we played well in the first half of both of our games uh, against Chapel Hill and Purdue. Uh, we had a 43 lead after four innings against Purdue. We had – I think it was like two to nothing going into the fifth inning against uh, Chapel Hill. And then the wheels fell off in both games, unfortunately. Um, but uh, that learning experience was huge going into 2019 and then 2020. Um, now we've won the regular season twice in a row. Um, the expectation that becomes an expectation. Now uh, we know the work ethic uh, the that has to be done. Um, the work that has to be completed to, to win uh, guys have experienced that, so now they expect uh, both from themselves and from their their teammates uh, that you are going to put in the same amount of work that they are, if not more, um, and they're going to start holding guys more accountable. And we've seen that, and it's been a, such a slow process because you want to snap your fingers and it be done. Uh, you want to jump ahead and be like, wow, this is crazy because you hear about Vanderbilt and you hear Coach Corbin speak and, and they're – and that I feel like he barely has to coach. Uh, I said like the, I mean, he get, he just gets to do the fun parts, but I mean, that's not by accident. I mean, he's, he's done the, the work. I mean, they were, whenever we were coming up, I mean, Vanderbilt wasn't Vanderbilt. Um, they were just another school. Uh, so uh, they've obviously turned things around. It's been a long process and now they've got the expectation uh, there of a, of a national championship every year. And that's what we're trying to get to, uh, it's, it sounds crazy to say, but I think one of the biggest things that I've learned from Coach Hall is, is have lofty expectations, have lofty goals. Uh, some people might laugh at you. Say, well, that's never been done. It's not going to happen. But, I mean, if you don't set the expectation for yourself, then you're never going to reach it. Uh, you don't know what's possible. So I, I've, I've taken that from him and, and ran with it. Our, our new goals and expectations now are, are 40 wins, uh, win the regular season, win the conference tournament, and then win a regional. Um, so that we're we're not shy about it. We talk about it with any recruit that we've got uh, on campus, or or right now we've got recruits on video chats. So um, we're two of those goals that we've set have never been done A and T before. So that's that's the fun part. So that's that's one of our selling points. I mean, you want to come to to a school and, and do something that's literally never been done before. You can come to A and T and win a regional. Uh, there's never been a uh, HBCU in the nation to, to win a regional. Um, they've, they've been a couple close, but uh, it's never been done. So we, we can sort of uh, make history uh, in a sense. 
Um, so that's a that's a big part of it. And I think the expectations in terms of playing those bigger schools, like we were talking about when we went down to South Carolina, that was our I think that was our first like true marquee win. Yeah. Up until that point, I mean, we we had close call after close call after close call with Chapel Hill, with NC State, uh, with you name them. And we would lose any way you can possibly have. We would lose 10 to nine. We'd lose one to nothing. Um, and, it, and it just sucked. And then finally we get over the hump, beat uh, South Carolina, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, we can do this. Uh, we start looking around. It was like, all right. And then our guys, it was it was funny. So that that's a funny story in of in of itself. I was actually I I, I rode <laughs> I rode myself down there because I had to go see a, a pitcher that was actually pitching in a high school game in Columbia that night. Uh, so I, uh, I rode myself down there, did BP, did the, uh, the pregame stuff, said, all right, guys, see you. And went to see the high school game oh, wow. uh, 15 minutes down the road. And then obviously I'm watching it on my phone. I can, and you get to about to the, like the fifth inning. Uh, and I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm checked out of this high school game where I'm watching it on my phone. We're winning two to nothing. And I'm talking to another coach who was at the game, and I was like, do I go back or do I just stay here? I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't want to ruin anything. So I ended up going back, and I watched the the last two innings uh, from the left field bleachers uh, oh, wow. <laughs> at that game. And I'm just sweating. I'm so nervous, uh, way more nervous in the stands than I ever am in the, in the uh, dugout. And so – we ended up winning, and I'm running down there, and I'm like, I'm pumped. I'm, I'm like, oh, let's go. And I get down there, and our guys are, they're pretty excited, but they're not acting like they won the World Series. And I was like, what is that? I mean, they, so these guys are sort of getting to the point where, hey, man, we're supposed to win some of these games. Uh, we're, we're not, we're not a doormat anymore. So that's that mindset. You start seeing it, and then we, when we, when you lose games that you know should have won, uh, you got that look in their eyes, um, and then when you win games that you didn't play well in there all of a sudden that win doesn't feel as good. Uh, five years ago, any win was like a cause for celebration. Let's uh, we need those W's, but now it's like, Hey, we, they gave us that one, but we need to get better. So that expectation level uh, across the board has, has been risen um, uh, an extreme amount. And it goes primarily to the players, but it definitely starts up top uh, with coach Hall. That's awesome, man. Ton of good things there. Um, it, it, it's awesome to hear work ethic, accountability, uh, setting standards, you know, for yourself, uh, you know, get get the culture and the foundation laid and then uh, sit back and enjoy the ride. And and uh, kind of like you talking about with Coach Corbin. So awesome stuff there. Let's uh, let, let's let's flip and talk toward recruiting. So uh, in a normal year, obviously not now, you're uh, <laughs> you're out. You're out on the road and, and watching high school games and at, at camps and, and, and tournaments and different things all across the, the southeast, I'm sure. Uh, tell me what you're looking for. I mean, you're a, you're, a, you're a catching guy. You're a hitting guy. Let's start with catchers. Uh, you go out to, to watch a catcher behind a dish. What are you looking for in that guy? Yeah, so in terms of specifically recruiting a catcher, um, I think the, the first thing that I, I notice with a guy is they're just their position of their body. Um, whether they they look like they they're comfortable back there, um, I mean, there's a lot of guys that are catching but aren't really catchers. Uh, that could be across the board at any position. But uh, in terms of a catcher, I think the first thing I notice is their setup and everything like that. Uh, second thing I notice is their hands um, in terms of receiving, uh, how well they receive the ball, uh, is it in the pocket every time, uh, their footwork, arm strength. Really, all the all the tools that in in general, um, athleticism. I, we're we're far far past the days of, of old where you just put a, a big a big dude back there who can't really move. Um, so you got to be a good athlete back there. You got to have a strong arm, uh, and you got to have good hands. I think uh, in terms of us specifically, uh, with me being the catching coach, I I feel like the the thing that I'm best at at coaching and and improving with our guys is the positioning of their body and their receiving. Uh, so if I think he's got a really strong arm and I think he's got good feet, uh, and but just the hands are okay, then I feel like I would take a chance on that guy more so than uh, than the opposite because I feel like uh, with everything that we do at practice and, and what we work on, uh, I think the receiving is going to get better and I think the body positioning is going to get better um, more so than uh, – 
than in terms of improving arm strength and arm accuracy and th- and stuff like that. Uh, and a big thing outside of the physical realm of, of a catcher is their motor, their baseball IQ. Uh, those are things that are really hard. Uh, well, baseball IQ is hard to get a sense for uh, when you're watching a guy. High motor isn't. Uh, you, you just you either got it or you don't. Um, and if you've got a high motor, then generally you don't have uh, – that doesn't take a game off. Um, you're vocal. You're running down to, to back up first base on a ground ball to the shortstop. Um, you're uh, just in the right positions. Uh, I think that that goes a long, long way in terms of being a catcher. Uh, I think it goes a long way probably the most for, for catchers and shortstops. Uh, you want get those guys to be leaders on the field. You want them to have a high motor and you want them to have a high baseball IQ. Um, you want those guys to be confident as well. So it, let's say I evaluate Cam Beard as a catcher, and I say, okay, I'm going to reach out to his coach, get his phone number, whatever. Uh, whenever I talk to you, I'm going to expect probably a different conversation than I would from uh, a, a left fielder or a first baseman. Um, I want that guy to be a little bit more confident with his answers, a little bit more just – uh, well spoken in terms of uh, have, being able to have a baseball conversation. Uh, I think we can get away with it with other positions, but uh, you want a catcher to have that uh, ingrained in his DNA. And obviously, it's going to grow. I don't expect him to know everything about the position uh, in high school, but um, you want that that desire uh, to know baseball and 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 learn the game from a mental side uh, from that position, but. Uh, I think defense comes first uh, with uh, with our catchers. Uh, there's been times where they've had to get their their uh, hitting done and early work and late work because they had bullpens that day. Um, and our guys know that. Our, our catchers know that going in. I tell them, listen, catching is a huge, uh, huge uh, responsibility. Uh, you've got to handle the pitching staff, and that comes first. Anything offensively is, is icing on the cake. Now, they're they're still they're still trying to hit at a high level. Uh, don't get me wrong, but um, we we're gonna go with the best defensive catcher most times uh, when we're filling out a lineup. That's awesome. I I can't tell you how many college coaches we've had on here and how communication gets brought up. You're talking about that that phone call with that guy or that visit. And uh, I, again, I can't tell you how many times that's been a, a huge piece of the recruiting mm-hmm. processes. Now, how does this guy talk? Does he have a personality, uh, or am I talking to a stop sign here? Uh, is he confident? You know, can he? How does he carry himself? That's that's awesome. And, and I tell you too, another thing you mentioned uh, back to receiving versus the the physical tools, the arm strength, things like that. We're, we're talking. Grant obviously works with our catchers. Uh, he was mm-hmm. talking this past weekend to guys and says, you know, obviously in a game receiving is number one. You're going to catch it far more times than you throw it or block it or whatever. Uh, but, dude, if you can't throw, it don't matter. No matter how good you yeah. receive it, you know, you, you, you got to have those tools. So uh, I, I was glad that you uh, that you brought that in there. And uh, and obviously the mental side is huge with, with catchers. Uh, I mean, you, it may be cliche, but you, you hear it. You know, you're talking about shortstops, yeah. the quarterbacks of the field. I mean, they're, they're the guys who are – um, who were kind of getting it all done and seeing the whole field. Let's flip to the other side. Let's talk about hitters. You go out and you watch your hitter uh, step in the box in a game or a showcase or whatever. What what are you looking for there? Um, I think the the biggest thing that – because it, it varies from, from player to player, honestly. I mean, uh, there's a bunch of different types of hitters. But in general, um, I think the, the a really big thing is approach. Um, I feel like the mechanics can be tweaked. Uh, it's a lot harder to get people to not swing at balls, um, to step in there uh, and be on time, uh, which is sort of mechanical but sort of mindset. Um, uh, the actions are important. The swing is important, no doubt. But the way they take a fastball at their eyes, the way they spit on a breaking ball in the dirt, because um, if they can't spit on a breaking ball in the dirt in high school – uh, and and let's, it might be 70 miles an hour. Uh, when they get to college and they face a 83 mile per hour slider that starts at their knees uh, from a guy who's throwing low to mid 90s, I mean they're 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 not going to spit on that thing. Right. Um, so that that I think is huge. Um, and then in general, we're we're not a very cookie cutter type offense. Uh, we've got a bunch of different types of hitters: lefties, righties, speed guys, contact guys, power guys. Um, 
I think what what gets lost in the in the shuffle is just ability to to make consistent contact with the barrel. Um, some guys have a knack for it, and it might not look pretty, but I mean, my goodness, they they put the barrel on the ball hitters no matter hit. what. Yeah, yeah, hitters hit exactly. So that um, that just watching them. If you see a pitcher, if you see a catcher, I can generally get an idea um, after one game um, whether you can do it defensively, whether you can pitch at a high level. Uh, but in terms of hitting, I mean, you that's the one where you want to see him probably more than uh, more than once, more than twice, uh, see as many at-bats as he possibly can just to get a sense of, uh, of their overall approach. Because you might see a really, really good hitter uh, go 0 for 4 with, with two punch-outs. Um, because hitting is difficult. Uh, you might see a really bad hitter go three for four uh, with a double, and he might fool you. So uh, it's a it's a much uh, more difficult thing, I think, to evaluate consistently uh, is just an offensive uh, guy. Um, luckily, at a high school level, it's a little bit more difficult, too, because you don't have stats, um, like, consistently across the board. I know some schools keep them better than others, but – um, but then you never know. I mean, like a high school coach might send you stats and it might, it might've been from his mom, uh, <laughs> doing the stats. You never know what you're getting. So the Juco stuff, uh, you can, you can generally take their stats into account, uh, cause you know, the competition that they're playing against, you can see what they did against certain teams that, you know, have good arms. Um, but in terms of, of recruiting a hitter and, and actually evaluating them, I think, the mindset is huge, and that goes back to the communication that we talked about as well. Uh, you want a guy that, that can get on the phone and, and sort of talk you through his approach of that at bat. Um, you, you know, we've had guys, and, and, and I've talked to guys, like, was that a, was that a fastball or curveball that, that you hit? Yeah, I don't know. So <laughs> you're like, how do you not know, man? Well, you, you, you hit a double. Like, you saw the baseball. Yeah, I don't know. So uh, just an idea of, of – and it gives you a sense that they know what they're doing. They've got a plan at the plate. Um, so that that's the generic side of things when we're looking when, – whenever I'm on the road and I see, I see a hitter and say, well, I like him. That's awesome. Let's, let's, let's switch and talk about recruiting in today's climate. You know, here we are heading into the summer. Uh, no baseball games being played. You're stuck at home. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I imagine things like emails. Uh, you know, there's, there's videos out there, things like – uh, the flat ground app, field level. There's different avenues for guys to still uh, promote themselves, if you will, or get their name to you. H how much of that stuff are you guys looking at during this? Yeah, so we we've all I've always looked at it. I mean, I think it's a good way to get names. Yep. Um, uh, I think the video. Uh, I think you need to. You don't need to pay a thousand bucks for somebody to take video of you. I think you can go out there and 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 get pretty good video. Uh, by, by yourself. I mean, everybody's got a, a pretty good resolution on their, on their iPhone. Um, so the video is huge at this point. Now I can't speak going forward. I mean, I don't know when the next time I'm going to actually see a live baseball game is, but um, at this point it's all, it's only been really secondary information for us. Um, the primary information that I, that I look for is just what I see with my own eyes in person. Uh, Cause you can't beat that. Sure. Uh, and then does the does the video uh, uh, confirm that or or make you question it at all? Uh, so I, we've used it um, a ton. I, I think it's like I said, a great way to uh, to get your name into in, into our uh, database, uh, get your name in front of our eyes. Uh, that way, I've said, okay, I've seen this guy's video. I need to go see him in person. Um, or or whatever the deal might be. But we've used it a ton, and I, I think it's only gonna grow in terms of uh, the usage um i don't know if we'll ever get to that point where that will be the only thing that we see and then we recruit a guy and offer him a scholarship um but as of right now it's definitely great secondary information gotcha hey talk talk to our our, our players directly for a second let's say i'm a i'm a 2021 20, guy 2022 whatever uh i'm an infielder uh, I'm, I'm at the point where I'm, I'm starting to get some video. I'm going to send it to Coach Jordan at, at A&T. Uh, what are you looking for there? I mean, how, how long, how many ground balls, how many at-bats, game at-bats? What are you looking for in that video? Yeah, so uh, I think it can be 
either kind. Obviously, game footage is, is awesome to have. The problem with game footage in high school is a lot of times it is it is not great quality. It might be at a weird angle through a chain link fence, and you might have done, done really well, but it doesn't really give you a good view of it. Um, uh, now, infield is a lot harder. I mean, you got to be pretty much filming the whole game to get that. Um, but I think there there's something to be said for just your your swings off of a tee and off of BP uh, with a clear view um, uh, in that camera, so you can see the full swing. And I think uh, if I was a high school kid right now and I was trying to send a video to me uh, as a college coach, uh, I would make sure that you can see the whole thing. <laughs> like you can see the whole swing. It's not too far zoomed in or too far away. Um, I think in turn for me, I would say uh, from the opposite batter's box view uh, of hitting. Um, and then if you're going to send some stuff with uh, in terms of infield play, I mean, just get as a few ground balls right at you just like a pro style workout backhand and a backhand or two and, and uh, maybe another view if you want to of just uh, arm strength across the diamond and a, a radar gun never hurts to have it in and <laughs> anytime you whether you're pitching or throwing uh, across the infield try to get the radar gun actually in the camera don't just say hey it was 85 miles per hour across the diamond because like I said stats can be lied <laughs> uh, numbers can be can be fudged so uh, I think uh, it doesn't need to be long, like what you said. I mean, five, ten swings, five or ten ground balls. Uh, you don't need a ton, uh, honestly, just enough to show what you're able to do. And then um, if I see it and I like it, then I'm going to go out and watch it play or I'm going to reach out to your college or your high school coach or I'm going to um, ask for more video. So that's it's, it's never a bad thing to have video. That's awesome. I appreciate you you going through that because again, our our guys, uh, our oldest team right now is uh, is sixteen. You guys are primarily sophomores, and they're they're getting to that point where they're starting to think about those things. And, you know, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. How do I put it together? So, a uh, ton of good information there. Here, here's where I want to finish while we're talking about technology. One of the next things uh, we're looking to upfit the facility with here in Maiden is is some technology stuff. Um, you know, and I know there's a ton of good things out there and. Uh, you know, it's kind of the, the new thing is technology and data. Uh, what are some of the things at A&T that you guys are using? Uh, let's just say with, with your hitters, uh, since that's who you're working with. Where, where are you at with the yeah. technology piece? Yeah, so I think technology is huge. I think one bit of technology that we've always used and, and will continue to use is video. And, and, I mean, you can't really have a substitute for that, uh, whether it's game footage cage footage, um, no matter what it might be, you can always have a point where you can revert back to and see it with your own eyes. Like this is what I was doing whenever I was doing really well compared to this is what I was doing while I was in the slump. Is it a mechanical thing? Uh, and you can go back and forth and check that out. Um, in terms of the other side of technology, we use diamond kinetics, uh, swing sensors. And what that measures is hand speed, barrel speed, um, lengthen the zone. Um, it really measures pretty much everything that you can possibly imagine outside of the baseball uh, is all the swing. It doesn't tell you launch angle or exit velocity um, or estimated distance. It just tells you what your swing is. So if it's got, it's got an approach angle. So if it's negative, that means you're swinging down through contact. If it's zero, then you're swinging completely flat, like parallel with the ground at contact. And if it's positive, you're going up through contact. So um, we've used that and it, and it builds like a 3d model of your swing to give you another visual. And that's probably been the biggest thing. I, I I've told this story a couple times to, to some people and, and we had a, he was a senior, he's coming back. So that's, that's exciting, but right. left-handed hitter never really done what, uh, we thought he would do, uh, in his first three years. Part of that was injury related, but it just wasn't as consistent as, as you would imagine. He's got some pop from the left side. And he's got a good swing, and you're just watching it. Why is this not coming out? And then we get him on the diamond kinetics, and it ended up being that he was really steep uh, downhill through contact. And it didn't necessarily look like it uh, to the naked eye because, for whatever reason, it was just that lefty swing, and it ended up being too downhill because he would end up finishing high. But what was happening, he was just swinging pretty much like a V. So he 
if he made it contact at that one spot, I mean, it was coming off the bat at a, at a high exit velocity, but it was definitely not consistent. So what we were able to do is use that model. And so I was like, now you need to get this point right here. And he could see it. And we made a little uh, adjustment with the setup and it flattened his barrel out a ton. Now he's making consistent contact. He was our best hitter uh, going into the ending of the our season this year. So um, I think it can be a huge tool, and we use it a lot. Um, we get, we pretty much use those diamond kinetic sensors on our bat for every game situation, uh, a game-like swing, not in real games, but in like inner squads. Um, when we crank up the machine uh, and do actual velo off the machine, we don't use it so much on drills uh, because some of our drills – we don't really need to see exactly your bat path on the drill. Uh, you're not swinging at full full uh, intent. Um, you're trying to swing down or you're trying to swing inside out. Um, but we use it pretty much every game-like swing that you can possibly get so we can actually see uh, what you're doing when it, when it really counts. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I tell you, one of the big things I, I'm hearing there, going back to the, the left-handed hitter, uh, and I actually read a piece this morning talking about, you know, knowledge is power, but data is just data. So, you know, we can have all this stuff, but if I don't know how to take it and now move that point like you're talking about and actually yeah. make an adjustment that's going to, you know, get me where I need to be, then all I've got is numbers. All I've got is data. Yeah. So, so, so taking that, you know, now let's go get a plan. Now let's go back to the drills. Let's go, let's go to work on it and let's see where we come out you know, a week later, two weeks later, whatever. Absolutely. Um, that's the big thing. I, I think people, you know, they get the idea that, uh, you know, every time we hop in the cage, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to get all this data. And it's not always about that. It's about here's, here's where we're at. Let's measure. Now let's go to work and let's figure out where we're at. That, yeah. That's the, and I think that's plan. what – yeah, I think that's what we try to use it for is, is to – and our guys have constant access to it, so it's not like we regulated at all any of the information – um, but we try to communicate with them as much as possible. Like, listen, you, this is another tool that you use. It is not the end all be all. Um, we go to a facility, uh, sometimes that has, um, hit tracks and we, we, we take into account how hard you're hitting the baseball because that tells you whether you can hit it, uh, in the air or not really essentially, uh, and be, consistently uh successful so some guys are not going to be able to hit it uh 25 degrees up in the air consistently because they're just going to fly out every time um now there's some guys that they can hit it higher <laughs> more consistently and hit nothing but doubles and home runs um but at the end of the day uh it's another tool that we use uh like i said not the end all be all um, and we try to make it individualized as much as possible um and that goes back to the communication stuff. And that goes back to what you were saying with uh, transferring that data into an actual coaching point. I mean, um, who am I to tell Mike Trout that what he thinks is wrong? Um, uh, just like who am I to tell Chipper Jones what he thinks is wrong? Uh, same goes for Chris Bryant and Josh Donaldson. Uh, these guys are the best hitters in the world. And whatever they're thinking and whatever they're working on is obviously working. I'm not going to go in and tell them they're wrong. I'm going to figure out why that's working for them and try to build upon that. Um, so there's guys in our program that if you tell them to swing down, and I was like this. I mean, I was very literal. If you told me to swing down, I mean, I was swinging down. I was chopping wood. If you told me to swing up, I was swinging up. Uh, there's guys in our program, though, if you tell them to swing down, I mean, they've got a perfect uh, bat path. You tell them to swing up, they might have a perfect bat path. Uh, if you, but there's also guys. If you tell them, hey, you want to be five degrees positive uh, approach angle through the baseball, they take that, and who knows what they do with it, man. I mean, it goes all different directions, and it seems like uh, a good thing to do <laughs> because that's what you want to be. Uh, but you can't always just say that and, and expect the best. Yeah, yeah. And that's awesome, man. And uh, uh, certainly we, we appreciate all you've uh, given to us as far as insight and uh, information, a ton of good stuff there. Uh, appreciate you coming on. Can't thank you enough. Uh, next time you're in town, we got to get you by the facility. Uh, come hang out and see the place. No doubt, man. I remember 
I remember when they were first getting that thing started. <laughs> I was yeah. like, I don't know. Well, I, I should know to never underestimate the Remberts because it's always going to be probably a little bit bigger and better than the, what the original idea was. That's right. Uh, but yeah, man, I, I'm glad you you had me on. I appreciate it. It was good catching up. And uh, uh, like I said, I, I look for every opportunity to help out back home. Awesome. Thanks again. All right, man.